Arnold J. Twenty Civilization on Trial New York Oxford University Press Copyright 1948 by Oxford University Press, Inc. Printed in the United States of America Preface Although the essays collected in this volume have been written at different dates, several as long as 20 years ago, the majority within the last 15 months, the book has, in the writer's mind, a unity of outlook, aim, and idea which, he hopes, will be felt by his readers. The unity of outlook lies in the standpoint of a historian who sees the universe and all that therein is, souls and bodies, experience and events, an irreversible movement through time-space. The common aim that runs through the series of papers is to gain some gleam of insight into the meaning of this mysterious spectacle. The governing idea is the familiar one that the universe becomes intelligible to the extent of our ability to apprehend it as a whole. This idea has practical consequences for the historical method. An intelligible field of historical study is not to be found within any national framework, we must expand our historical horizon to think in terms of an entire civilization. But this wider framework is still too narrow, for civilizations, like nations, are plural, not singular, there are different civilizations which meet and, out of their encounters, societies of another species, the higher religions, are born into this world. That is not, however, the end of the historian's quest, for no higher religion is intelligible, in terms of this world only. The mundane history of the higher religions is one aspect of the life of a kingdom of heaven, of which this world is one province. So history passes over into theology. To him return ye everyone. Acknowledgements 10 out of the 13 essays in this book were published separately before being brought together here, and the writer and the publishers take this opportunity of thanking the original publishers for their courteous permission to reprint. My View of History was first published in England in the contact publication Britain Between East and West, the present. Point in History, 5 Copyright 1947 by Foreign Affairs, Does History Repeat Itself? 5. Copyright 1947 by The New York Times, The International Outlook, 5. Copyright 1947 by International Affairs, is based on addresses given at Harvard University on April 7, 1947, at the Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto branches of the Canadian Institute of International Relations during the following week, and at the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London on May 22 of the same year, Civilization on Trial, 5 copyright 1947 by The Atlantic Monthly, is based on a lecture delivered at Princeton University on February 20, 1947, Russia's Byzantine Heritage, 5 published in Horizon of August 1947, is based on the first lecture in a series delivered at Bryn Mawr College in February and March 1947 on the Mary Flexner Foundation, Christianity and Civilization, 5 copyright 1947 by Arnold J. Toynbee, Pendle Hill Publications, is based on the Burge Memorial Lecture for that year, which was delivered in the Sheldonian Theatre at Oxford on May 23, 1940, at a critical moment, as it happened, in the history of both the lecturer's own country and the world. The Meaning of History for the Soul, 5 Copyright 1947 by Christianity in Crisis, is based on a lecture delivered at Union Theological Seminary, New York, on March 19, 1947, the Greco-Roman Civilization V is based on a lecture delivered at Oxford University in the summer term of one of the interwar years, in a course organized by Professor Gilbert Murray, a prolegomena to various subjects studied in the Oxford School of Light Ray Humaniores, the dwarfing of Europe V is based on a lecture delivered in London on October 27, 1926, with Dr. Hugh Dalton in the chair, in a series organized by the Fabian Society on The Shrinking World, Dangers and Possibilities. 5 A.J. Toynbee, January 1948. Contents 1. My View of History, 3 2. The Present Point in History, 16 3. Does History Repeat Itself? 29 4. The Greco Roman Civilization, 42 5. The Unification of the World and the Change in Historical Perspective, 62 6. The Dwarfing of Europe, 97 7. The International Outlook, 126 8. Civilization on Trial, 159. Russia's Byzantine Heritage, 164 10. Islam, the West, and the Future, 184 11. 
Encounters Between Civilizations, 2.13.12. Christianity and Civilization, 2.25.13. The Meaning of History, for the Soul, 253. 1. And my view of history My view of history is itself a tiny piece of history, and this mainly other people's history and not my own, for a scholar's life work is to add his bucketful of water to the great and growing river of knowledge fed by countless bucketfuls of the kind. If my individual view of history is to be made at all illuminating, or indeed intelligible, it must be presented in its origin, growth, and social and personal setting. There are many angles of vision from which human minds peer at the universe. Why am I a historian, not a philosopher or a physicist? For the same reason that I drink tea and coffee without sugar. Both habits were dot formed at a tender age by following a lead from my mother. I am a historian because my mother was one before me, yet at the same time I am conscious that I am of a different school from hers. Why did I not exactly take my mother's cue? First, because I was born by my mother into the next generation to hers, and my mind was, therefore, not yet set hard when history took my generation by the throat in 1914, and, secondly, because my education was more old-fashioned than my mother's had been. My mother. Belonging as she did to the first generation, in England, of university women, had obtained an up-to-date education in modern Western history, with the national history of England itself as the principal guideline. Her son, being a boy, went to an old-fashioned English public school and was educated, both there and at Oxford, almost entirely on the Greek and Latin classics. For any would-be historian, and especially for one born into these times, a classical education is, in my belief, a priceless boon. As a training ground, the history of the Greco-Roman world has its conspicuous merits. In the first place, Greco-Roman history is visible to us in perspective and can be seen by us as a whole, because it is over, in contrast to the history of our own Western world, which is a still unfinished play of which we do not know the eventual ending and cannot even see the present general aspect from our own position as momentary actors on its crowded and agitated stage. In the second place, the field of Greco-Roman history is not encumbered and obscured by a surfeit of information, and so we can see the wood, thanks to a drastic thinning of the trees during the interregnum between the dissolution of the Greco-Roman society and the emergence of our own. Moreover, the conveniently manageable amount of evidence that has survived is not overweight by the state papers of parochial principalities, like those which, in our Western world, have accumulated, ton upon ton, during the dozen centuries of its PRC atomic bomb. Age the surviving materials for a study of Greco-Roman history are not only manageable in quantity and select in quality, they are also well balanced in their character. Statues, poems, and works of philosophy count here for more than the texts of laws and treaties, and this breeds a sense of proportion in the mind of a historian nursed on Greco-Roman history, for, as we can see in the perspective given by lapse of time more easily than we can see it in the life of our own generation, the works of artists and men of letters outlive the DEDS of business under scoremen, soul. Deers, and statesmen. The poets and the philosophers outrange the historians, while underscore the prophets and the saints overtop and outlast them all. The ghosts of Agamemnon and Pericles haunt the living world of today by grace of the magic words of Plummer and Thucydides and, when Homer and Thucydides are no longer read, it is safe to prophesy that Christ and the Buddha and Socrates will still be fresh in the memory of, to us, almost inconceivably distant generations of men. The third, and perhaps greatest, merit of Greco-Roman history is that its outlook is ecumenical rather than parochial. Athens may have eclipsed Sparta and Rome Samium, yet Athens in her youth made herself the education of all Hellas, while Rome in her old age made the whole Greco-Roman world into a single commonwealth. In Greco-Roman history, surveyed from beginning to end, unity is the dominant note, and, when once I had heard this great symphony, I was no longer in danger of being hypnotized by the lone and outlandish music of the parochial history of my own country, which had once enthralled me when I listened to my mother telling it to me in installments, night by night, as she put me to bed. The historical pastors and masters of my mother's generation, not only in England but in all Western countries, had been eagerly promoting the study of national history in the mistaken belief that it had a closer bearing on their 
countrymen's lives and was, therefore, somehow more readily accessible to their understanding than the history. Of other places and times, although it is surely evident that, in reality, Jesus' Palestine and Plato's Greece were more potently operative than Alfred's or Elizabeth's England in the lives of English men and women of the Victorian age. Yet, in spite of this misguided Victorian canonization, so alien from the spirit of the father of English history, the venerable Bede, of the history of the particular country in which one happened to have been born, the unconscious attitude of the Victorian Englishman towards history was that of someone living outside history alto. Gether Jehi took it for granted, without warrant, that he himself was standing on terra firma, secure against being engulfed in that ever-rolling stream in which time had borne all his less privileged sons away. H. and his own privileged state of being emancipated, as he supposed, from history, the Victorian Englishman gazed with curiosity, condescension, and a touch of pity, but altogether without apprehension, at the spectacle of less fortunate denizens of other places and periods struggling and foundering in history's flood, in much the same way as, in a medieval Italian picture, the saved lean over the balustrade of heaven to look down complacently at the torments of the damned in hell. Charles I, worse luck for him, had been in history, but Sir Robert Walpole, though threatened with impeachment, had just managed to scramble out of the surf, while we ourselves were well beyond high water. Mark in a snug coin of vantage, where nothing could happen to us. Our more backward contemporaries might, perhaps, still be waist high in the now receding tide, but what was that to us? I remember, at the beginning of a university term during the Bosnian crisis of 1908 9, Professor L. B. Anamir, then. An undergraduate at Balliol and back from spending a vacation at his family home just inside the Galician frontier of Austria, saying to us other Balliol men, with, it seemed to us, a portentous air, well, the Austrian army is mobilized on my father's estate and the Russian army is just across the frontier, half an hour away. It sounded to us like a scene from the chocolate soldier, but the lack of comprehension was mutual, for a lynx-eyed Central European observer of international affairs found it hardly credible that these English undergraduates should not realize that a stone's throw away, in Galicia, their own goose, too, was being cooked. Hiking round Greece three years later on the trail of Epaminandus and Philippiman and listening to the talk in the village cafes, I learned for the first time of the existence of something called the foreign policy of Sir Edward Gray. Yet, even then, I did not realize that we too were still in history, after all. I remember feeling acutely homesick for the historic Mediterranean as I walked, one day in 1913, along the Suffolk coast of a grey and uneventful North Sea. The General War of 1914 overtook me expounding Thucydides to Balliol undergraduates reading for light ray humaniors, and then suddenly my understanding was illuminated. The experience that we were having in our world now had been experienced by Thucydides in his world already. I was rereading him now with a new perception, perceiving meanings in his words, and feelings behind his phrases, to which I had been insensible until I, in my turn, had run into that historical crisis that had inspired him to write his work. Thucydides, it now appeared, had been over this ground before. He and his generation had been ahead of me and mine in the stage of historical experience that we had respectively reached. In fact, his present had been my future. But this made nonsense of the chronological notation which registered my world as modern and Thucydides' world as ancient. Whatever chronology might say, Thucydides' world and Jimmy's world had now proved to be philosophically contemporary slash and, if this were the true relation between the Greco-Roman and the Western civilizations, might not the relation between all the civilizations known to us turn out to be the same? This vision, new to me, of the philosophical contemporaneity of all civilizations was fortified by being seen against a background provided by some of the discoveries of our modern Western physical science. On the timescale now unfolded by geology and cosmogony, the five or six thousand years that had elapsed since the first emergence of representatives of the species of human society that we label civilizations were an infinitesimally brief span of time compared to the age, up to date, of the human race, of life on this planet, of the planet itself, of our own solar system, of the galaxy in which it is one grain of dust, or of the immensely vaster and older sum total of the stellar cosmos. By comparison with these orders of temporal magnitude, civilizations that had emerged in the 2nd millennium BC, like the Greco-Roman, in the 4th millennium BC, 
like the ancient Egyptian, and in the first millennium of the Christian era, like our own, were one another's contemporaries indeed. Thus history, in the sense of the histories of the human societies called civilizations, revealed itself as a sheaf of parallel, contemporary, and recent essays in a new enterprise, a score of attempts, up to date, to transcend the level of primitive human life at which man, after having become himself, had apparently lain torpid for some hundreds of thousands of years, and was still, in our day, so lying in out-of-the-way places like New Guinea, Tierra del Fuego and the northeastern extremity of Siberia, where such primitive human communities had not yet been pounced upon and either exterminated or assimilated by the aggressive pioneers of other human societies that, unlike these sluggards, had now, though this only recently, got on the move again. The amazing present difference in cultural level between various extant societies was brought to my attention by the works of Professor Teckert of the University of California. This far-going differentiation had all happened within these brief last five or six thousand years. Here was a promising point to probe in investigating, subspecie temporis, the mystery of the universe. What was it that, after so long a pause, had so recently set in such vigorous motion once again, towards some new and still unknown social and spiritual destination, those few societies that had embarked upon the enterprise called civilization? Backslash, what had roused them from a torpor that the great majority of human societies had never shaken? Off. This question was simmering in my mind when, in the summer of 1920, Professor Namir, who had already put Eastern Europe on my map for me, placed in my hands Oswald Spengler's Untergang die Abendlands. As I read those pages teeming with firefly flashes of historical insight, I wondered at first whether my whole inquiry had been disposed of by Spengler before even the questions, not to speak of the answers, had fully taken shape in my own mind, f one of my own cardinal points was that the smallest intelligible fields of historical study were whole societies and not arbitrarily insulated fragments of them like the nation-states of the modern West or the city-states of the Greco-Roman world. Another of my points was that the histories of all societies of the species called civilizations were in some sense each parallel and contemporary, and both these points were also cardinal in Spengler's system. But when I looked in Spengler's book for an answer to my question about the genes of civilizations, I saw that there was still work for me to do, for on this point Spengler was, it seemed to me, most unilluminatingly dogmatic and deterministic. According to him, civilization carried a rose, de evil op-ed, declined, and, foundered in unvary. ing confier mighty w with, a fixed timetable asterisk and no explanation was off-read for any of this. It was just a law of nature, which S. Pengler had detected, and you must take it on TRUST, from the mast, R. Ipsy DMR. F. This arbitrary fiat seemed disappointingly unworthy of Spengler's brilliant genius, and here I became aware of a difference in national traditions. Where the German a priori method drew blank, let us see what could be done by English empiricism. Let us test alternative possible explanations in the light of the facts and see how they stood the ordeal, slash, race and environment were the two main rival keys that were offered by would-be scientific 19th-century Western historians for solving the problem of the cultural inequality of various extant human societies, and neither. Key proved, on trial, to unlock the fast-closed door. To take the race theory first, what evidence was there that the differences in physical race between different members of the genus Homo were correlated with differences on the spiritual plane which was the field of history? And, if the existence of this correlation were to be assumed for the sake of argument, how was it that members of almost all the races were to be found among the fathers of one or more of the civilizations? The black race alone had made no appreciable contribution up to date, but, considering the shortness of the time during which the experiment of civilization had been on foot so far, this was no cogent evidence of incapacity, it might merely be the consequence of a lack of opportunity or a lack of stimulus. As for environment, there was, of course, a manifest similarity between the physical conditions in the lower Nile Valley and in the lower Tigris-Euphrates Valley, which had been the respective cradles of the Egyptian and Sumerian civilizations, but, if these physical conditions were really the cause of their emergence, why had no parallel civilizations emerged in the physically comparable valleys of the Jordan and the Rio Grande? 
And why had the civilization of the equatorial Andean plateau had no African counterpart in the highlands of Kenya? The breakdown of these would-be scientific and personal explanations drove me to turn to mythology. I took this turning rather self-consciously and shamefacedly, as though it were a provocatively retrograde step. I might have been less diffident if I had not been ignorant, as I was at that date, of the new ground broken by psychology during the War of 1914-18. If I had been acquainted at the time with the works of C. G. Young, they would have given me the clue. I actually found it in Goethe's Faust, in which I had fortunately been grounded at school as thoroughly as in Aeschylus Agamemnon. Goethe's prologue in heaven opens with the archangels hymning the perfection of God's creation. But, just because his works are perfect, the Creator has left himself for o scope for any further exercise of his creative powers, and there might have been no way out of this impasse if Mephistopheles, created for this very purpose had not presented himself before the throne and challenged God to give him a free hand to spoil, if he can, one of the Creator's choicest works. God accepts the challenge and thereby wins an opportunity to carry his work of creation forward. An encounter between two personalities in flick form of challenge and response, have we not here the flint and steel by whose mutual impact the creative spark is kindled? In Goethe's exposition of the plot of the Diviva coin. Media, Mephistopheles is created to be diddled, as the fiend, to his disgust, discovers too late J. Karadigif, in response to the devil's challenge, God genuinely puts his created works in jeopardy, as we must assume that he does, in order to win an opportunity of creating something new, we are also bound to assume that the devil does not always lose. And thus, if the working of challenge and response explains the otherwise inexplicable and unpredictable genes and growths of civilizations, it also explains their breakdowns and disintegrations slash carrot majority of the score of civilizations known to us appear to have broken down already, and a majority of this majority have trodden to the end the downward path that terminates in dissolution. Our post-mortem examination of dead civilizations does not enable us to cast the horoscope of our own civilization or of any other that is still alive j.e. spongier, there seems to be no reason why a succession of stimulating challenges should not be met by a succession of victorious responses. Ad infinitum ton the other hand, when we make an empirical comparative study of the paths which the dead civilizations have respectively traveled from breakdown to dissolution, we do here seem to find a certain measure of Spanglerian uniformity, and this, after all, is not surprising. Since breakdown means loss of control, this in turn means the lapse of freedom into automatism, and, whereas free acts are infinitely variable and utterly imprei, dictable, automatic processes are apt to be uniform and regular. Briefly stated, the regular pattern of social disintegration is a schism of the disintegrating society into a recalcitrant proletariat and a less and less effectively dominant minority. The process of disintegration does not proceed evenly, it jolts along in alternating spasms of rout, rally, and rout. In the last rally, but one, the dominant minority succeeds in temporarily arresting the society's lethal self-laceration by imposing on it the peace of a universal state. Within the framework of the dominant minority's universal state the proletariat creates a universal church, and after the next rout, in which the disintegrating civilization finally dissolves, the universal church may live on to become the chrysalis from which a new civilization eventually emerges. T to modern Western students of history, these phenomena are most familiar in the Greco-Roman examples of the Pax Romana and the Christian Church. The establishment of the Pax Romana by Augustus seemed, at the time, to have put the Greco-Roman world back upon firm foundations after it had been battered for several centuries by perpetual war, misgovernment, and revolution. But the Augustan rally proved, after all, to be no more than a respite. After 250 years of comparative tranquility, the empire suffered in the third century of the Christian era collapse from which it never fully recovered, and at the next crisis, in the fifth and sixth centuries, it went to pieces irretrievably. The true beneficiary of the temporary Roman peace was the Christian Church. The Church seized this opportunity to strike root and spread, it was stimulated by persecution until the Empire, having failed to crush it, decided, instead, to take it into partnership. And, when even this reinforcement failed, 
To save the empire from destruction, the church took over the empire's heritage, slash the same relation between a declining civilization and a rising religion can be observed in a dozen other cases. In the Far East, for instance, the Tsn and Han Empire plays the Roman Empire's part, while the role of the Christian church is assumed by the Mahayana school of Buddhism, L. If the death of one civilization thus brings on the birth of another, does not be at first sight hopeful and exciting. Quest for the goal of human endeavors resolve itself, after all, into a dreary round of vain repetitions of the Gentiles? Slash this cyclic view of the process of history was taken so entirely for granted by even the greatest Greek and Indian souls and intellects, by Aristotle, for instance, and by the Buddha, that they simply assumed that it was true without thinking it necessary to prove it. On the other hand, Captain Marriott, in ascribing the same view to the ship's carpenter of HMS Rattlesnake, assumes with equal assurance that this cyclic theory is an extravaganza, and he makes the amiable exponent of it a figure of fun. To our Western minds the cyclic view of history, if taken seriously, would reduce history to a tale told by an idiot, signifying nothing. L but mere repugnance does not in itself account for effortless unbelief. The traditional Christian beliefs in hellfire and in the list Trump were also repugnant, yet they continued to be believed for generations. For our fortunate Western imperviousness to the Greek and Indian belief in cycles we are indebted to the Jewish and Zoroastrian contributions to our W. Altenschank. In the vision seen by the prophets of Israel, Judah, and Iran, history is not a cyclic and not a mechanical process. It is the masterful and progressive execution, on the narrow stage of this world, of a divine plan which is revealed to us in this fragmentary glimpse, but which transcends our human powers of vision and understanding in every dimension. Moreover, the prophets, through their own experience, anticipated Aeschylus' discovery that learning comes through suffering, a discovery which we, in our time and circumstances, have been making too. El shall we opt, then, for the Jewish Zoroastrian view of history as against the Greco-Indian? So drastic a choice may not, after all, be forced upon us, for it may be that the two views are not fundamentally irreconcilable. After all, if a vehicle is to move forward on a course which its driver has set, it must be borne along on wheels that turn monotonously round and round, d carrot heil civilizations rise and fall and, in falling, give rise to others, some purposeful enterprise, higher than theirs, may all the time be making headway, and, in a divine plan, the learning that comes through the suffering caused by the failures of civilizations may be the sovereign means of progress. Abraham was an emigre from a civilization in extremis, the P. Roffitt's W.E.R.E. children of another civilization in disintegrate e. O. N. C. H. R. Christianity was Bo M. of T. He suffering S. of a Dicein Tigre Ting Greco Roman world. Carrot will some comparable spiritual enlightenment be kindled in the displaced persons who are the counterparts, in our world, of those Jewish exiles, to whom so much was revealed in their painful exile by the waters of Babylon? The answer to this question, whatever the answer may be, is of greater moment than the still inscrutable destiny of our world-encompassing Western civilization. 2. The present point I in history, where does mankind stand in the year 1947 of the Christian era? This question no doubt concerns the whole living generation throughout the world, but, if it were made the subject of a worldwide Gallup poll, there would be no unanimity in the answer. On this matter, if any, quote hominis, tot sententiae, so we must ask ourselves in the same breath, to whom is our question being addressed? For example, the writer of the present paper is a middle-class Englishman of 58. Evidently his nationality, his social milieu, and his age, between them, will in large measure determine the standpoint from which he views the world panorama. In fact, like each and all of us, he is more or less the slave of historical relativity. The only personal advantage that he can claim to possess is that he happens also to be a historian, and is therefore at least aware that he himself is a piece of sentient flotsam on the eddying surface of the stream of time. Realizing this, he knows that his fleeting and fragmentary vision of the passing scene is no more than a caricature of the surveyor's chart. God alone knows the true picture. Our individual human apergus are shots in the dark. The writer's mind runs back 50 years, to an afternoon in London in the year 1897. He is sitting with his father at a window in Fleet Street and watching a procession of Canadian and Australian mounted troops who have come to celebrate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. 
he can still remember his excitement at the unfamiliar, picturesque uniforms of these magnificent colonial troops, as they were still called in England then, slouch hats instead of brass helmets, grey tunics instead of red. To an English child, this sight gave a sense of new life astir in the world, a philosopher, perhaps, might have reflected that, where there is growth, there is likely also to be decay. A poet, watching the same scene, did, in fact, catch and express an intimation of something of the kind. Yet few in the English crowd, gazing at that march past of overseas troops in London in 1897 were in the mood of Kipling's recessional. They saw their son standing at its zenith and assumed that it was there to stay, without their even needing to give it the magically compelling word of command which Joshua had uttered on a famous occasion. The author of the tenth chapter of the book of Joshua was at any rate aware that a standstill of time was something unusual. There was no day like that, before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. Yet the middle-class English in 1897, who thought of themselves as Wellesian rationalists, living in a scientific age, took their imaginary miracle for granted. As they saw it, history, for them, was over. It had come to an end in foreign affairs in 1815, with the Battle of Waterloo, in home affairs in 1832, with the Great Reform Bill, and in imperial affairs in 1859, with the suppression of the Indian Mutiny. And they had every reason to congratulate themselves on the permanent state of felicity which this ending of history had conferred on them. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yeah, I have a goodly heritage. Viewed from the historical vantage point of A.D. 1947, this fin de siècle middle-class English hallucination seemed sheer lunacy, yet it was shared by contemporary Western middle-class people of other nationalities. In the United States, for instance, in the North, history, for the middle class, had come to an end with the winning of the West and the federal victory in the Civil War, and in Germany. Or at any rate in Prussia, for the same class, the same permanent consummation had been reached with the overthrow of France and foundation of the Second Reich in 1871. For these three batches of Western middle class people fifty years ago, God's work of creation was completed, and behold it was very good. Yet, though in 1897 the English, American, and German middle class, between them, were the political and economic masters of the world, they did not amount, in numbers, to more than a very small fraction of the living generation of mankind, and there were other people abroad who saw things differently, even though they might be impotent and inarticulate. In the South, for example, and in France, there were in 1897 many people who agreed with their late conquerors that history had come to an end, the Confederacy would never rise from the dead, Alsace-Lorraine would never be recovered. But this sense of finality, which was so gratifying to Top Dog, did not warm a defeated people's heart. For them it was nothing but a nightmare. The Austrians, still smarting from their defeat in 1866, might have felt the same if the stirrings of submerged nationalities inside an empire whose territory Bismarck had left intact had not begun, by this time, to make the Austrians feel that. History was once more on the move and might have still worse blows than Koenigratz in store for them. English liberals at the time were indeed talking freely, and with approval, of a coming liberation of subject nationalities in Austria-Hungary and the Balkans. But, in spite of the specter of home rule and the stirrings of Indian unrest, it did not occur to them that, in southeastern Europe, they were greeting the first symptoms of a process of political liquidation which was to spread, in their lifetime, to both India and Ireland and, in its irresistible progress. Round the world, was to break up other empires, besides the Habsburg monarchy. All over the world, in fact, though at that time still under the surface, there were peoples and classes who were just as discontented as the French or the Southerners were with the latest deal of history's cards, but who were quite unu illing to agree that the game was over. There were all the subject peoples and all the depressed classes, and what millions they amounted to. They included the whole vast population of the Russian Empire of the day, from Warsaw to Vladivostok, Poles and Finns determined to win their national independence, Russian peasants deter. Mind to gain possession of the rest of the land of which they had been given so meager a slice in the reforms of the 1860s, Russian intellectuals and businessmen who dreamed of one day governing their own country through parliamentary institutions, as people of their kind had long been governing the United States, Great Britain.
and France, and a young and still small Russian industrial proletariat that was being turned revolutionary-minded by living conditions that were grim enough, though perhaps less so than those of early 19th-century Manchester. The industrial working class in England had, of course, M. Proved their position very notably since the opening of the 19th century, thanks to the factory acts, the trades unions, and the vote, they had been enfranchised by Disraeli in 1867. Still, in 1897, they could not, and did not, look back on the Poor Law Act of 1834, as Carat 1C middle class did look back on the Reform Bill of 1832, as history's last word in wisdom and beneficence. They were not revolutionary, but, on constitutional lines, they were resolved to make the wheels of history move on. As for the continental European working class, they were capable of going to extremes, as the Paris Commune of 1871 had shown in an ominous lightning flash. Asterisk this deep desire for changes and the strong resolve to bring them about by one means or another were not, after all, surprising in the underdog, as represented by underprivileged classes and defeated or unliberated peoples. The IT was strange, though, that the apple cart should be upset, as it was in 1914, by the Prussian militarists, who in truth, had as little to gain and as much to lose as the German, English, and American middle class, deliberately tearing open again history's insecurely closed book. The subterranean movements that could have been detected, even as far back as 1897, by a social seismologist who put his ear to the ground, go far to explain the upheavals and eruptions that have signalized the resumption of history's juggernaut march during the past half-century. Today, in 1947, the Western middle class which, 50 years ago, was sitting carefree on the volcano's crust, is suffering something like the tribulation which, 100 to 150 years ago, was inflicted by juggernaut's car on the English industrial working class. This is the situation of the middle class today not only in Germany, France, the Low Countries, Scandinavia, and Great Britain, but also in some degree in Switzerland and Sweden, and even in the United States and Canada. The future of the Western middle class is in question now in all Western countries, but the outcome is not simply the concern of the small fraction of mankind directly affected, for this. Western middle class, this tiny minority, is the leaven that in recent times has leavened the lump and has thereby created the modern world. Could the creature survive its creator? If the Western middle class broke down, would asterisk it bring humanity's house down with it in its fall? Whatever the answer to this fateful question may be, it is clear that what is a crisis for this key minority is inevitably also a crisis for the rest of the world. It is always a test of character to be baffled and up against it, but the test is particularly severe when the adversity comes suddenly at the noon of a halcyon day. Which one has fatuously expected to endure to eternity? In straits like these, the wrestler with destiny is tempted to look for bugbears and scapegoats to carry the burden of his own inadequacy. Yet to pass the buck in adversity is still more dangerous than to persuade oneself that prosperity is everlasting. In the divided world of 1947, communism and capitalism are each performing this insidious office for one another. Whenever things go awry in circumstances that seem ever more intractable, we tend to accuse the enemy of having sown tares in our field and thereby implicitly excuse ourselves for the faults in our own husbandry. This is, of course, an old story. Centuries before communism was heard of, our ancestors found their bugbear in Islam. As lately as the 16th century, Islam inspired the same hysteria in Western hearts as communism in the 20th century, and this essentially for the same reasons. For like communism, Islam was an anti-Western movement which was at the same time a heretical aversion of a Western faith, and, like communism, it wielded a sword of the spirit against which there was no defense in material armaments. The present Western fear of communism is not a fear of military aggression, such as we felt in face of a Nazi Germany and a militant Japan. The United States at any rate, with her overwhelming superiority in industrial potential and her monopoly of the know-how of the atom bomb, is at present impregnable against military attack by the Soviet Union. For Moscow, it would be sheer suicide to make the attempt, and there is no evidence that the Kremlin has any intention of committing such a folly. TG a communist weapon that is making America so jumpy 
and, oddly enough, she is reacting more temperamentally to this threat than the less sheltered countries of Western Europe, the spiritual engine of propaganda. Communist propaganda has a know-how of its own for showing up and magnifying the seamy side of our Western civilization and for making communism appear a desirable alternative way of life to a dissatisfied faction of Western men and women. Communism is also a competitor for the allegiance of that great majority of mankind that is neither calm. Munist nor capitalist, neither Russian nor Western, but is living at present in an uneasy no man's land between the opposing citadels of the two rival ideologies. Both nondescripts and Westerners are in danger of turning communist today, as they were of turning Turk 400 years ago, and, though communists are in similar danger of turning capitalist, as sensational instances have shown, the fact that one's rival witch doctor is as much afraid of one's own medicine as one is afraid, oneself, of his. Does not do anything to relieve the tension of the situation. Yet the fact that our adversary threatens us by showing up our defects, rather than by forcibly suppressing our virtues, is proof that the challenge he presents to us comes ultimately not from him, but from ourselves. It comes, in fact, from that recent huge increase in Western man's technological command over non-human nature, his stupendous progress in know-how, which was just what gave our fathers the confidence to delude themselves into imagining that, for them, history was comfortably over. Through these triumphs of clockwork the Western middle class has produced three undesigned results, unprecedented in history, whose cumulative impetus has set juggernauts, car rolling on again with a vengeance. Our Western know-how has unified the whole world in the literal sense of the whole habitable and traversable surface of the globe, and it has inflamed the institutions of war and class, which dot are the two congenital diseases of civilization, into utterly fatal maladies. This trio of unintentional achievements presents us with a challenge that is formidable indeed. War and class have been with us ever since the first civilizations emerged above the level of primitive human life some five or six thousand years ago, and they have always been serious complaints. Of the twenty or so civilizations known to modern Western historians, all except our own appear to be dead or moribund. And, when we diagnose each case in extremis or post-mortem, we invariably find that the cause of death has been either war or class or some combination of the two. To date, these two plagues they've been deadly enough, in partnership, to kill off 19 out of 20 representatives of this recently evolved species of human society, but, up to now, the deadliness of these scourges has had a saving limit. While they have been able to destroy individual specimens, they have failed to destroy the species itself. Civilizations have come and gone, but civilization, with a big C, has succeeded, each time, in reincarnating itself in fresh exemplars of the type, of four, immense, though the social ravages of war and class have been, they have not ever yet been all. Embracing the asterisk when they have shattered the top strata of a society, they have usually failed to prevent the underlying strata from surviving, more or less intact, and clothing themselves with spring flowers on exposure to the light and air. And when one society has collapsed in one quarter of the world it has not, in the past, necessarily dragged down others with it. When the early civilization of China broke down in the 7th century BC, this did not prevent the contemporary Greek civilization, at the other end of the old world, from continuing to rise towards its zenith. And when the Greco-Roman civilization finally died of the twin diseases of war and class in the course of the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries of the Christian era, this did not prevent a new civilization from successfully coming to birth in the Far East during those same 300 years. Why cannot civilization go on shambling along, from failure to failure, in the painful, degrading, but not utterly suicidal way in which it has kept going for the first few thousand years of its existence? The answer lies in the recent technological inventions of the modern Western middle class. These gadgets for harnessing the physical forces of non-human nature have left human nature unchanged. The institutions of war and class are social reflections of the seamy side of human nature, or what the theologians call original sin, in the kind of society that we call civilization. These social effects of individual human sinfulness have not been abolished by the recent portentous advance in our technological know-how, but they have not been left unaffected by it either. Not having been abolished, they have been enormously keyed up, like the rest of human life, in respect of their physical potency. 
class has now become capable of irrevocably disintegrating society and war of annihilating the entire human race. Evils which hitherto have been merely disgraceful and grievous have now become intolerable and lethal, and, therefore, we in this westernized world in our generation are confronted with a choice of alternatives which the ruling elements in other societies in the past have always been able to shirk, with dire consequences, invariably, for themselves, but not at the extreme price of bringing to an end the history of mankind on this planet. We are thus confronted with a challenge that our predecessors never had to face, we have to abolish war and class, and abolish them now, under pain, if we flinch or fail, of seeing them win a victory over man which, this time, would be conclusive and definitive. The new aspect of war is already familiar to Western minds. We are aware that the atom bomb and our many other new lethal weapons are capable, in another war, of wiping out not merely the belligerents, but the whole of the human race. But how has the evil of class been heightened by technology? Has not technology already notably raised the minimum standard of living, at any rate in countries that have been specially efficient or specially fortunate in being endowed with the riches of nature and being spared the ravages of war? Can we not look for? War to seeing this rapidly rising minimum standard raised to so high a level, and enjoyed by so large a percentage of the human race, that the even greater riches of a still more highly favored minority will cease to be a cause of heart. Burning, the flaw in this line of reasoning is that it leaves out of account the vital truth that man docks not live by bread alone. However high the minimum standard of his material living may be raised, that will not cure his soul of demanding social justice, and the unequal distribution of this world's goods between a privileged minority and an underprivileged majority has been transformed from an unavoidable evil into an intolerable injustice by the latest. Technological Inventions of Western Man When we admire aesthetically the marvelous masonry and architecture of the Great Pyramid or the exquisite furniture and jewelry of Tutankhamun's tomb, there is a conflict in our hearts between our pride and pleasure in such triumphs of human art and our moral condemnation of the human price at which these triumphs have been. But, the hard labor unjustly imposed on the many to produce the fine flowers of civilization for the exclusive enjoyment of a few who reap where they have not sown. During these last five or six thousand years, the masters of the civilizations have robbed their slaves of their share in the fruits of society's corporate labors as cold-bloodedly as we rob our bees of their honey. Asterisk THC moral ugliness of the unjust act mars the aesthetic beauty of the artistic result, yet, up till now, the few favored beneficiaries of civilization have had one obvious common sense plea to put forward in their own defense. It has been a choice, they have been able to plead, between fruits of civilization for the few and no fruits at all. Our technological command over nature is severely limited. We have at our command neither sufficient muscle power nor sufficient labor to turn out our amenities in more than minute quantities. If I am to deny these to myself just because you cannot all have them too, we shall have to shut up shop and allow one of the finest talents of human nature to rust away buried in a napkin, and, while that is certainly not in my interest, it is surely not in yours either on a longer view. For I am not enjoying this monopoly of amenities exclusively for my own benefit. My enjoyment is at least partly vicarious. In indulging myself at your expense, I am in some sense serving as a kind of trustee for all future generations of the whole human race. Tia's plea was a plausible one, even in our technologically go-ahead care at Western world, down to the 18th century inclusive, but our unprecedented technological progress in the last 150 years has made the same plea invalid today. In a society that has discovered the know-how of Amalthea's cornucopia, the always ugly inequality in the distribution of this world's goods, in ceasing to be a practical necessity, has become a moral enormity. Thus the problems that have beset and worsted other civilizations have come to a head in our world today. We have invented the atomic weapon in a world partition between two supremely great powers, and the United States and the Soviet Union stand respectively for two opposing ideologies whose antithesis is so extreme that as it stands, it seems irreconcilable. Along what path are we to look for salvation in this parlous plight, in which we hold in our hands the choice of life or death, not only for ourselves, but for the whole human race? Salvation perhaps lies, as so often, in finding a middle way, asterisk in politics.
This golden mean would be something that was neither the unrestricted sovereignty of parochial states nor the unrelieved despotism of a centralized world government, in economics it would be something that was neither unrestricted private enterprise nor unmitigated socialism. And one middle-aged middle-class West European observer sects the world today, salvation comp neither from the East nor from the West. In AD 1947, T registered IE United States and the Soviet Union are alternative embodiments of contemporary man's tremendous material power, their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. But in the mouths of these loudspeakers, one docks not hear dot the still small voice. Our cue may still be given us by the message of Christianity and the other higher religions, and one the saving words and deeds may come from unexpected J. Quarters. Asterisk posit way of looking at a book. In the Syrian world, for instance, to which the Jews belonged, a book was certainly not regarded as a mere mnemonic aid to human discourse. It was revered as the revealed word of God, a sacred object, in which every jot and tittle on the written page had a magical potency and therefore an immeasurable importance. It is one of the curiosities of history that our own traditional way of studying the Greek and Latin classics is derived from the Jewish way of studying the law and the prophets. In other words, we handle these Greek and Latin books in an utterly different way from that in which they were used, and were meant to be used, by their authors and their broadcasters at the time when they were made. Our Jewish rabbinical way of studying a book has merits which are so obvious that one need not dwell on them. When once one has been drilled into this discipline, one continues, for the rest of one's life, to read everything with a closeness and thoroughness, which is, most certainly, much better than the way in which one reads. A newspaper M wrote to one's office. This is a lesson which is never to be forgotten, but it is not the last lesson to be learnt from a study of the Greco-Roman civilization. We cannot resign ourselves to that drastic and misleading limitation of outlook which is the defect of the virtue of the microscopic, intensive rabbinical study of a sacred book or a classic. The rabbinical outlook has two vices. It inclines one to think of a book as a thing in itself, something static and dead, instead of seeing it, for what it is, as the material track or echo or debris of human action to percent, for intellectual acts are as authentic a form of action as exertions of willpower or of physical energy. The second vice is really the same thing stated in more general or philosophic terms. The rabbinical method of study makes one inclined to think of life in terms of books instead of vice versa. The opposite method, which is the Greek line of approach, is to study books not just for their own sake, but also because they are the key to the life of the people who wrote them. If, following the rabbinical rather than the Hellenic line, one were to concentrate his attention upon some particular period of Greek or Roman history for the sake of some famous literary work of that age which happens to have survived to the present day, one's historical vision might be very badly distorted, because the survival of certain portions of Greek and Latin literature, and the loss of other parts, has been determined by known historical causes, and these causes, in themselves, have nothing to do with the question whether the ages that produced the surviving literature were historically important and the ages that produced the lost literature were historically of no account. To show what I mean, I shall put the surviving Latin books aside for a moment and take the surviving Greek books first. If one runs through a list of surviving Greek books, one finds that the vast majority of them were written in either one or the other of two periods which are separated from one another by a gap of some three centuries. The most famous, the classics par excellence, were written within a period extending over not more than five or six generations and ending in the generation of Demosthenes, i.e. approximately between 480 and 320 BC. But there is another surviving group which begins in the last century BC with writers like Diodorus Siculus and Strabo. This later group of surviving Greek authors is perhaps larger in bulk than the earlier group, and it contains such famous names as Plutarch and Lucian and Arian and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Substantially, our surviving Greek literature dates either from the classical or from the imperial age. The surviving works of the intervening Hellenistic age are either short or fragmentary. Why is this? The selection looks odd and arbitrary at first sight, but we happen to know the reason for it. 
The reason is that, in the generation of Augustus, the Greco-Roman world, which had been going to pieces during the four centuries ending in the year 31 BC, the year of the Battle of Actium, made a desperately earnest and temporarily successful effort to pull itself together. Psychologically, this effort took the form of a sort of homesickness for what now looked like a golden age in the past, an age in which Greek life had apparently been a happier and more splendid thing than it was in the last century BC. And the people who felt like this in that later age sought salvation in archaism, in a deliberate attempt at an artificial resurrection of past happiness and beauty and greatness. One can study this archaistic movement of the imperial age in religion and in literature. In literature, it led people to repudiate the modem Hellenistic style, to admire and study the medieval Attic style, and to become indifferent to the preservation of Greek books which were not either the Attic originals themselves or else ultra. Modern Neo-Attic Imitations of Them now this does explain why our surviving Greek literature represents the imperial age and the classical age almost exclusively, and why the literature of the intervening Hellenistic age has mostly dropped out. But, if one is a historian, this does not make one feel, well then, the Hellenistic age cannot be worth studying. On the contrary, the historian thinks to himself, this difference in the degree of happiness and success and civilization between the Greco-Roman world in the last century BC and the Greek world in the 5th century BC is something extraordinary and something terrible, for the people in the last century BC were plainly right. In the intervening age, there had been an enormous regression, an immense setback. How and why did that setback take place? The historian sees that the Greco-Roman world achieved a rally in the generation of Augustus after the Battle of Actium. He also sees that the preceding breakdown began with the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, for centuries earlier. For him, the vitally interesting problem is, what was it that went wrong in the 5th century and continued to go wrong until the last century BC? Now, the solution of this problem can only be found by study. ING Greek and Roman history as a continuous story with a plot that is one and indivisible. And, therefore, from the historian's point of view, it is a defect in our traditional curriculum that, while it makes sure that one shall study the first chapter of this story by reading Thucydides and study the last chapter by reading Cicero, it gives one very little encouragement to study the intervening chapters because these do not happen to be recorded in any consecrated and canonical classical work of either Greek or asterisk Latin literature. And yet, if these middle chapters are left out, the Thucydidian and the Ciceronian chapters, left stranded at either end of the story, become shapeless bits of wreckage out of which it is impossible to reconstruct either the true build of the ship or the true story of the wreck. Asterisk let us imagine a hypothetical parallel in the history of our own world. Let us anticipate the situation after the next war, too when Great Britain, as well as continental Europe, will have been bombed to bits, and our Western civilization quite destroyed in its original European home, with the consequence that nothing is ever going to happen in Europe anymore. That hypothetical picture of Europe as she may be before the end of the 20th century corresponds, of course, to the real picture of Greece as she actually was by the last century BC. Then, let us suppose to ourselves that the Anglo-Saxon variety of our Western civilization has just managed to survive, maimed and stunted and barbarized, in the overseas English-speaking countries. After that, let us picture the Americans and Australians making a great effort to salvage the remnants of their hereditary European culture, and, in particular, to recover and safeguard the purity of their English speech and English literary style. Well, what, in these circumstances, will they do? They will decree that the only classical English is the English of Shakespeare and Milton, they will teach nothing but this English henceforward in their schools and write nothing but this English, or what they fancy to be the Shakespearean and Miltonic idiom. In their newspapers and magazines. And, as life will have become rather nasty and brutish, and the market for books will have very much fallen off, they will allow all the intervening literature in the English language, from Dryden to Macefield inclusive, to go out of print. 3. That, I think, is an accurate analogy, in our own terms, of what actually happened to Greek literature. 
but, suppose this did happen to the lecture on which this paper is based was delivered in the interwar period 1918-39, three at the time when these words were written, the author did not foresee that he himself would live to witness the partial translation of his fancy into fact. In our own case, suppose that, for some reason or other, the whole of English literature, from the Restoration to the Post-Victorians inclusive, were discredited and forgotten, would it be wise to infer from this that the 18th and 19th centuries, in which the bulk of this lost literature had been written, were centuries of now? Consequence in the history of our Western world? Let us now turn to the Latin books. And I will ask my readers to think of these Latin classics, though the conception of them that I am going to suggest may seem rather surprising at first thoughts, as an appendage to the survive. ING Greek works of the imperial age, as a version of Greek literature in a Latin dress. Asterisk the earliest complete extant works in Latin, the surviving plays of Plautus and Terence, are undisguised translations of Hellenistic Greek originals. And I should say that, in a rather subtler sense, the whole of Latin literature, including even such masterpieces as the poems of Virgil, is in essence a version of Greek originals translated into the Latin. After all, I can quote the second most famous of all the Latin poets for my purpose. Indeed, the tag is so well worn that I hardly dare bring it out. Conquered Greece took her savage conqueror captive and introduced the arts into rustic Latium, Grecia captiferum victorum sepit, et the arts into la digresti Latio. We all know the passage, and we all know that it is true. The mere linguistic difference between the Latin and Greek languages creates no division of literary style and no break in literary history. After all, our own modern Western literature is conveyed in a dozen different vernacular languages, Italian, French, Spanish, English, Gur. Man, and the rest, Yet no one would dream of saying that these were really all separate literatures, or that any of them would or could be what it actually is if there had not been a perpetual give and take between all these modem Western vernaculars for centuries, Dante, Shakespeare, Goethe, and the other giants, they are all exponents of a literature that is one and indivisible. L, the difference between these different linguistic vehicles is of minor importance. Latin literature stands, I should say, to Greek as English literature stands to Italian and French. Or let us look at the relation between Latin literature and Greek literature in another way. Let us employ the simile of a wave and think of the Greco-Roman civilization as a movement in a spiritual medium, an emission of spiritual energy, which wells up from a spring of original inspiration in Greece and radiates its influence outwards from Greece in all directions in concentric waves. It is in the nature of a wave, when it is passing through a resistant medium, to become weaker and fainter the farther it travels outwards from its point of emission until, eventually, at a certain distance, it dies away. And now let us follow the course of the wave of Greek literature as it travels outwards from Greece. At the outset, near home, the wave is so powerful that it carries along with it the use of the Greek language. When Xanthus the Lydian takes to writing history in the Greek style in the 5th century BC, he employs not only the Greek style but the Greek language as well, and, as far afield in this direction as Cappadocia in the 4th century of the Christian era, the wave of Greek literature is still strong enough to carry the Greek language with it. This foreign Greek is used by the Cappadocians, Gregory of Nazianzus and the rest, when they are roused into literary activity in the 4th century after Christ because the wave of Greek influence has now just reached them. But, a century or so later, when the same wave, traveling still farther afield, reaches Syria and Armenia, it has become so weak that it has had to leave the Greek language behind, and the literature which is now produced, under Greek influence, by Syrians and Armenians is written not in Greek, but in the Syriac and Armenian languages. And now let us follow the same wave as it travels in the opposite direction, not eastwards, but westwards. In this direction, when it reaches Sicily, it is still so strong that it simply sweeps away the non-Greek local language of the native Sicilians. So far as we know, no literary works were ever written in this Sicel language in Sicily, any more than any were ever written in Lydian in Asia Minor. The Greek language was overpowering at this short range. I have already referred to the work written in the Greek language by a historian who lived in the last century BC, Diodorus Siculus. 
This Diodorus was a genuine Sicel and not a Sicelliot or Greek colonist on Sicilian soil. His native city, Agerium, was a Sicel city, in the interior of the island, where no Greek colony had ever been planted. Yet Diodorus writes in Greek as a matter of course. All the same, there was, in Diodorus's day, a version of the Greek literature in the Sicel's native language which was beginning to produce great works of art. But this was happening farther afield, halfway up the Italian peninsula, in Latium, at a range at which the wave of Greek influence, expanding from Greece, was weaker. This continental Italian version of Greek literature was being produced in Latium in the living local Latin language of the country, with which the extinct Sicel language of Sicily seems to have been almost identical. When the wave of Greek leader Airy influence got as far as Latium, traveling westwards, it dropped the Greek language and took to the local vernacular just as it dropped Greek and took to Syriac and Armenian after it had traveled about the same distance eastwards. This conception of the Greek civilization as a kind of radiation out of Greece, a four-dimensional radiation in space-time, may also be illustrated from the history of coinage. In the 4th century BC King Philip of Macedon opened up a number of gold and silver mines in the Thracian territories which he conquered and annexed in the neighborhood of Mount Pangaeus. And he used the proceeds to issue a copious coinage. This coinage not only served to corrupt the politicians in the city-states of the Greek peninsula, it also spread northwestwards into the interior of continental Europe. Philip's coins passed from hand to hand and were imitated in one barbarian mint after another, until this coinage wave actually crossed the channel and spread into the island of Britain. The numismatists have been able to put together an almost continuous series, ranging from Philip's original issues of the 4th century BC to the British imitations which were struck two or three centuries later. It took this wave several centuries to travel that far. There are sets of this series in our museums, and a feature which we have already observed in our literature wave comes out in the coinage wave still more strongly. As the wave moves farther and farther away in space from its original place of emission, and farther and farther away in time from its original date of issue, it grows weaker and weaker. The Latin version of Greek literature is palpably inferior to the Greek original, and similarly, but to a far more grotesque degree, the British imitations of King Philip's coins are inferior to the original mintage. In the latest and remotest coins of the scries, the Macedonian king's image and the superscription in Greek characters in the Greek language have degenerated into a meaningless pattern. If we did not happen to possess examples of the intermediate terms in the series, we should never have known that there was any line of artistic affiliation between these later British coins and their Macedonian original. One could not have guessed that the pattern on the British coins was derived historically from an inscription in Greek, surrounding a human face. Before we throw aside this simile of radiation, we may remind ourselves of another wave of Greek civilization which has had a different and more surprising, and to my mind much more interesting, outcome. When one looks at a modern Japanese print or at a medieval Chinese painting, dating, say, from the period of the Sung Dynasty, one is not immediately reminded of the Greek style of art. Indeed, one's first impression is that he is face to face here with an art that is even more foreign from the Greek than it is from our own. And yet, if we take some Far Eastern work of art from the Far Eastern artistic golden age, say, the 5th to the 13th centuries of the Christian era, we can do the same thing that we have done already with those British coins of the last century BC. We can bring together a continuous series of works of art which stretches backwards in time from the second millennium of the Christian era, and westwards in space from China through the Darim Basin and the Oxus and Jaxarts Basin and Afghanistan and Persia and Iraq and Syria and Asia Minor. Until we arrive at the same point in space and time to which we are led back in our series of coin types, that is to say, back to the classical art of Greece in the age. Before RHE Generation of Alexander as we travel back over the wake of this wave, a Japanese portrayal of the Buddha melts into a Greek portrayal of Apollo by insensible degrees. But there is, of course, one obvious difference between the wave which begins in classical Greece and ends in a British coin and this other wave, which likewise begins in classical Greece, but ends in a Japanese painting of a landscape or statue of a bodhisattva. 
In both cases, the historical connection between the last term in the series and the first is unrecognizable until the intermediate terms have been fitted into their places, but the two curves, to think in a mathematical image, are quite different in character. In the series of coin types, we have a simple instance of degeneration. The art becomes poorer and poorer, steadily, as it recedes farther in space and in time from the Greece of the 4th century BC. In the other curve, which ends not in Gaul and Britain but in China and Japan, the beginning is the same. As the Greek art of the Hellenistic and the early imperial age spreads eastward, across the dead body of the defunct Persian Empire, until it reaches Afghanistan, it becomes more and more con. Ventional and commercial and lifeless. And then something like a miracle happens, t this fast degenerating Greek art collides in Afghanistan with another spiritual force, which is radiating out of India, the Mahayana form of Buddhism. And the degenerating Greek art unites with the Mahayana to produce a distinctively new and intensely creative civilization, the Mahayanian Buddhist civilization which has traveled northeastward across Asia to become the civilization of the Far East J. Ellera, we have stumbled upon a wonderful property of these spiritual waves of radiation though they're natural. Tendency is to weaken as they travel outwards, this tendency may be overcome and counteracted if two waves, traveling outwards from two different centers, happen to collide and coalesce. The coalescence of a Greek wave with an Indian wave has generated the Buddhist civilization of the Far East. But there is, of course, another instance of the same miracle, which is much more familiar to us. The same Greek wave has also coalesced with a Syrian wave, and it is this union that has generated the Christian civilization of our Western world. So much for this simile of waves of radiation. It is an illuminating way of looking at the histories of civilizations up to a point, but only up to a point. If we take it too seriously, and do not discard it when we have made the most of it, it may become an obstacle to our seeing farther still. These metaphorical applications of the processes of inanimate nature to the delineation of life, and particularly human life, are perhaps peculiarly dangerous nowadays just because they are so much in fashion. Not so long ago, the danger was all the other way, we used to think of the processes of inanimate nature anthropomorphically, and the progress of physical science was seriously hindered until this anthropomorphic, mythological habit of looking at physical nature was broken. We have, I think, broken it effectively. In our physical science, we are thoroughly on our guard nowadays against the so-called pathetic fallacy. But perhaps, in extricating ourselves from the pathetic fallacy, we have fallen unawares into an opposite apathetic fallacy, which is every bit as fallaciously see tend, because this feels and sounds scientific, and because science nowadays enjoys prestige to think and talk about human beings as though they were sticks and stones and about life as though it were a stream of radiation or a con. Stellation of protons and electrons? This may be a convenient simile, but it is, I am sure, a false road. Let us step out of this rut and set ourselves to think and speak of human civilizations in human terms. In human terms, how are we to describe the Greek civilization, or our own Western civilization, or any other forward slash of the 10 or 20 civilizations which we can count up on our fingers? Gene human terms, I should say that each of these civilizations is, while in action, a distinctive attempt at a single great common human enterprise, or, when it is seen in retrospect, after the action is over, it is a distinctive instance of a single great common human experience, this enterprise or experience is an effort to perform an act of creation. In each of these civilizations, mankind, I think, is trying to rise above mere humanity, above primitive humanity, that is, towards some higher kind of spiritual life. One cannot depict the goal because it has never been reached or, rather, I should say that it has never been reached by any human society. It has, perhaps, been reached by individual men and women. Cat least, I can think of certain saints and sages who seem to me, in their personal lives, to have reached the goal, at least in so far as I myself am able to conceive what the goal may be like. But if there have been a few transfigured men and women, there has never been such a thing as a civilized society. Civilization, as we know it, is a movement and not a condition, a voyage and not a harbor. No known civilization has ever reached the goal of civilization yet. There has never been a communion of saints on earth. 
In the least uncivilized society at its least uncivilized moment, the vast majority of its members have remained very near indeed to the primitive human level. And no society has ever been secure of holding such ground as it has managed to gain. In its spiritual advance, all the civilizations that we know of, including the Greek, have already broken down and gone to pieces with the single possible exception of our own Western civilization, and no child of tin civilization who has been born into our generation can easily imagine that our own society is immune from the danger of suffer. ING The Common Fate Now civilizations, I believe, come to birth and proceed to grow by successfully responding to successive challenges. They break down and go to pieces if and when a challenge confronts them which they fail to meet. Not unnaturally, there are challenges that present themselves in the histories of more than one civilization. And the peculiar interest of Greco-Roman history for us lies in the fact that the Greek civilization broke down in the 5th century BC. Through failing to find a successful response to the very challenge which is confronting our own Western civilization in our own lifetime. If we unwind the scroll of Greek history, we find ourselves studying both the presentation of this fateful challenge and the disastrous failure to discover an answer to it. In order to suggest what this challenge was, I must recall the salient events in the history of the Greek world before the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War in 431 UC. The first event is the creation of the city-states that brought law and order out of a social interregnum in the coastlands of the Aegean Sea which had followed the downfall of the Minoan Maritime Empire. The next event is a pressure of population upon means of subsistence in the home. Of the new civilization in Ionia and in continental European Greece. The third event is encasing of this pressure by a colonial expansion all over the Mediterranean, the foundation of colonial Greek city-states on barbarian ground. The fourth event is the stoppage of this Greek colonial expansion, in the course of the 6th century BC, partly through the successful resistance of the native victims and partly through the political consolidation of the Greek's own rivals in the competitive colonization of the western Mediterranean from the Levant, the Carthaginian and Etruscan powers on the west and the Lydian Empire, succeeded by the much greater Persian Empire, on the east. From the Greek standpoint the Persian Empire meant not so much the Persians as the Phoenicians of the Phoenician homeland in Syria, whose hands were strengthened by Persian support. In what we think of as the most brilliant age of the Greek civilization, the late 6th and early 5th centuries BC, the Greeks themselves had the feeling of being hemmed in and hampered and hard-pressed. As Thucydides saw it, from the age of Cyrus and Darius onwards Hellas was repressed from all sides over a long period of time, with the consequence that, in this period, she neither performed any great cooperative achievement nor showed any enterprise in the parochial life of the individual city-state communities. Thucydides, Book I, Chapter 17, as Herodotus saw it, the three successive generations covered by the reigns of Darius Histasp's son and Xerxes Darius' son and Artaxerxes Xerxes' son saw Hellas overwhelmed by more troubles than she had had to suffer from first to last. During the twenty generations preceding Darius' accession. Herodotus, Book 6, Chapter 98, but, as a matter of fact, this was the very age in which the Greek society succeeded in solving the new economic problem which had been presented to it by the stoppage of its geographical expansion, the problem now was how to obtain an increasing amount of subsistence for a still growing population out of a geographical area which had become stationary instead of continuing to expand. In Greek history, this problem was solved by a successful changeover from a merely extensive to a more or less intensive economic system, from mixed farming for mere local subsistence to specialized farming for export. And this revolution in agriculture produced a general revolution in Greek economic life, since the new specialized agriculture called for complementary developments in commerce and manufacture. One is studying this Greek economic revolution when one studies the history of Athens in the two generations of Solon and Pisistratus. This Attic economic revolution corresponds, historically, to the English Industrial Revolution at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries of our era, and it solved the Greek. Economic Problem of the 6th Century BC But the solution of the economic problem raised, in turn, a political problem which the Greek civilization failed to solve, and this political failure was the cause of its breakdown. 
The new political problem may be stated in the following way, so long as the economic life of each city-state remained parochial, they could all still afford to be parochial in their political life as well. The parochial sovereignty of each city-state, this of this every other, might and did breed perpetual petty wars, yet, in the economic circumstances of the age, these wars were not deadly in their social effects. But the new economic system, introduced by the Attic Economic Revolution under the spur of the stoppage of Greek colonial expansion, was based on local production. For international exchange, winky face. It could only work successfully if, on the economic plane, the city-states gave up their parochialism and became interdependent. And a system of international economic interdependence could only be made to work if it could be brought within the framework of a system of international political interdependence, some international system of political law and order which would place a restraint upon the anarchic parochial sovereignty of the local city-states. An international political order was offered, ready-made, to the Greek city-states of the 6th and 5th centuries BC by the Lydian and Persian and Carthaginian empires. The Persian Empire systematically imposed orderly political relations upon the Greek city-states which it subjugated, and Xerxes attempted to complete this work by proceeding to subjugate the still independent remnant of the Greek world. These still unconquered Greek city-states resisted Xerxes desperately, and successfully, because they rightly believed that a Persian conquest would take the life out of their civilization. They not only saved their own independence, but they also liberated the previously subjugated city-states of the archipelago and the Asiatic mainland. But, having rejected the Persian solution to a Greek political problem, the Greek victors were confronted with the task of finding some other solution, and it was here that they failed. Having defeated Xerxes in the years 480 and 479 BC, they were defeated between 478 and 431 BC by themselves. Sevens slash the Greeks' attempt at an international political order was the so-called Delian League, founded in 478 BC by Athens and her allies under Athenian leadership. And it is worth noticing, in passing, that the Delian League was modeled on a Persian pattern, one sees this if one compares the accounts of the system which the Athenian statesman Aristeax induced the liberated cities to accept in 478 BC. With the account, in Herodotus Book 6, Chapter 42, of the system which had been imposed upon these selfsame cities by the Persian authorities after the suppression of the so-called Ionian Revolt some 15 years before. But the Delian League failed to achieve its purpose. And the old political anarchy in the relations between the sovereign independent Greek city-states broke out again under new economic conditions which made this anarchy not merely harmful but deadly. The destruction of the Greco-Roman civilization era the failure to replace an international anarchy by some kind of international law and order occupies the history of the 400 years from 431 to 31 BC. After these four centuries of failure and misery there came, in the generation of Augustus, a partial and temporary rally. The Roman Empire, which was really an international league of Greek and other, culturally related, city-states, may be regarded as a tardy solution of the problem which the Delian League had failed to solve. But the epitaph of the Roman Empire is, too lack. The Greco-Roman society did not repent until it had inflicted mortal wounds on itself with its own hands. The Pax Roana was a piece of exhaustion, a piece which was not creative and therefore not permanent. Eltio was a peace and an order that came four centuries after its due time. One has to study the history of those four melancholy intervening centuries in order to understand what the Roman Empire was and why it failed. My conclusion is that we should look at this story as a whole. It is only when it is viewed as a whole that it throws its light upon our own situation in our own world in our day. But, if one does succeed in obtaining this light from it, it proves, experto creed, to be most amazingly illuminating. 5. The unification of TFAE world and the change in historical perspective familiarity is the open feet of the imagination, and, just because every Western schoolboy knows that the oceanic voyages of discovery made by West European mariners some four and a half centuries ago